So we are very lucky to have Christian Schaffner uh, give us uh, a one more uh, lecture, this time on position-based quantum crypto. Um, All right. Th thank you very much um, um, for the opportunity to do a, a second talk in this uh, in this series here. Um, uh, in a sense, it's not really much a continuation of, of last time, and also uh, in the in the in the abstract, uh, I will promise some connections to quantum folding homomorphic encryption. But I really really put this in at the at the very end of this talk, so and it will be on a very high level. And um, maybe I apologize to those of you who've maybe already seen this talk. I've given this a few times before. It's kind of a classic by now, but it contains some very nice computer science-y ideas. And so it's, I think it's just fun to, to, to see how this works. And there's actually not so much quantum in there, but there's probably some quantum in there that you haven't seen before. So, so it's, I think it's a good mix for this, for this school. All right, so let me start. Uh, it starts with, um, um, I will start with this picture, because in 1969, uh, man has first set foot on the moon. At least that's what this picture suggests. It has been sent around the world uh, by, by NASA. Um, however, there are some people who don't believe that. And they basically say that uh, this has just been filmed in, in some Hollywood studios. There's whole theories about that, like, uh, I think in these links, or the, it says that this has just been a hoax and the people argue about the, the shadow of the flag and, uh, and all kinds of stuff. Um, so, so one of the questions I want to address in this talk is like, how can you actually prove that you are at a specific location, like the moon? So, so that's what, what position-based crypto is, is about. And I'm, I'm going to show you in, in, in a few slides like what I exactly mean by that. So this is, uh, as I said, kind of um, some, some older work that I did together with many other people. And um, yeah, it's based on, on several papers that came out over the say, last almost 10 years. Um, so the goal here um, is to introduce a little bit of notation, but that's just uh, repeating what I had from, from last time. And then tell you a little bit about quantum teleportation. I think you have seen some of the basic notions of it. I'm going to show you some kind of more advanced version of it. And then talk about position-based crypto, show you a no-go theorem for, for post uh, position-based crypto and then introduce you to the garden hose model and this is actually a good point to to join in the uh, the talk for, in, for people who came, who came later and then we'll see you how this connects to the whole story before so that's the plan let's start with the notation so these are our familiar states from from last time um, we have these two kind of bases we have uh, bits that you can account in this basis so these are called the bb84 states because they're used for the um, Bennett and Brassar um, QKD protocol. And um, we saw last time, if you can measure them in some basis, if you measure them in the right basis, in the same colored basis, then you actually see what the state is. And if you measure a state uh, that was encoded in a computational basis, you measure it in the Hadamard uh, diagonal basis, well, then you get the red dot bit. And actually you collapse the states to that, um, to what you observed. So, um, we also saw the no cloning theorem. So that was basically saying, take one of these four states uh, at random, and then you, you, you won't be able to clone it like, like Dolly the sheep. But we know how to clone a quantum mechanics. does not allow that. I actually showed you even a little proof of it, basically because cloning would be a, a nonlinear operation and only linear operations are not allowed by quantum mechanics. So the new stuff on teleportation, um, this is not, uh, I'm not going to describe the Star Trek version, but the one that you probably um, uh, saw, and that was the one that was originally introduced by these people here. Some of them, uh, there's the BB again, and also there's Claude Crepeau, some of uh, that is well known in the, in the crypto community as well. So these guys uh, introduced uh, quantum teleportation back in 93. So how does it work? Um, we have Alice and Bob, two players there, um, probably they can be far apart from each other, hundreds, thousands of kilometers. However, they share a magic resource. So they share a quantum state, which is so-called EPR pair. So for Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen um, uh, pair. So it's in a particular state and it kind of is an, it's entangled. So uh, it has this magic glow uh, among them. And the, the qubits, so these are two qubits, and uh, each one of them individually, somehow it hasn't decided yet which state it should be. So formally, it's the fully mixed density matrix, but they are together in a very um, 
a particular state in a quantum state that you cannot uh, have uh, classically. Basically, uh, entanglement is defined as um, the inability to write it as a tensor product. So they're really kind of in a, in a correlated uh, state. And now if you share this magic resource, then you can do teleportation. So how does it work? Let's take one of our unknown qubit states. And now Alice wants to teleport this over to Bob. So what she's gonna do is she's gonna do a so-called Bell measurement. So this is uh, John Stuart Bell. Um, he, uh, this measurement is slightly more complicated than the ones we've seen so far because it acts on two qubits. So it's, it's kind of acting in a four dimensional space and you basically project onto one of the Bell states. You just ask which of the Bell states do we have? There are four of them. So there are four possible outcomes. Let's call this outcome Sigma. So it's basically just two bits and they are random. So whenever you put in half of an EPR pair into such a measurement, you will, you're guaranteed to get a fully random outcome. So it's the outcome is just zero, one, two, or three. And now the magic comes, kind of the EPR magic. It makes sure that this, that this other qubit here that was inserted into this Bell measurement actually magically appears on Bob's side, even though it's very far away. However, and that's important, it does not appear in the clear, it's actually encrypted. So it's actually um, under, under some lock. And the key to this lock is the outcome that Alice observed in this measurement. So um, only after she sends uh, this classical information sigma to Bob, Bob is able to kind of undo uh, this lock and recover the original state that, that Alice wanted to teleport. So this is maybe a, an explanation of a teleportation that you haven't seen in these terms before. But it's really, actually, you can see it that way. So in fact, this encryption here is really the quantum one-time path. So I, I don't know if, if you have talked about this before, but somehow and there's the classical one-time path, which you either flip a bit or not. And here you also do this in the, in the phase basis, in the Z basis. So this encryption is really saying, basically, has the, has the computational basis be flipped and has the phase basis be flipped. So, uh, both, both uh, in both bases, you can do a flip. And only if you know that, and that's exactly what you do to, to decrypt that state, you can actually recover the original state. So, so this is, um, yeah, this yeah. is one way to explain uh, quantum teleportation. Yes, mm -hmm. we not. Um, so the question mark is, is an arbitrary one qubit state? Or yes, yes. Uh -huh. okay. um, in, in, I, I was just using the, the, the qubits from, from the last slide, but this works for an arbitrary one qubit state. Oh. Yes. So uh, if, yep. if I, I just want to understand, uh, so this is teleportation because Alice chooses this question mark state. And when she does this measurement using the entangled uh, state, you get something and the, uh, the same state actually appears at Bob's yes, end. Exactly. Alice does not even need to know what the state is. She can just be given a qubit without knowing what it is. She can in that way teleport it over to Bob. So this and, is really, it really sounds like science fiction. Yes, and, and people were very puzzled by that. And you're, you're not the only ones. Even Einstein was wondering like, but this cannot be, you know, it's, it, it looks like, imagine they are really far away from each other. So how can it be that this state appears here magically? You know, it, it, sounds, yeah. like, it sounds like instantaneous communication, but that's, it is not. So, and it's important to observe that this actually does not contradict relativity theory. And the reason for it is that in fact, these states here are the same. So in fact, before uh, Bob knows what the sigma is, nothing has changed because this, as I said, if you, if you consider it on its own, it's just a fully mixed state as a density matrix. But if you take a qubit and encrypt it perfectly with the quantum one time path, you also get the fully mixed state. So this density oper operators of these two qubits are actually the same. And only after you learn the classical information, and that of course takes time to transmit from Alice to Bob. No, this cannot go faster than the speed of light. No classical information can go faster than the speed of light. So that's why there's no contradiction in relativity theory. Only after you learn the sigma, you can actually recover that state. Bye. So it's, it's true that uh, information is, is only communicated after you learn the classical uh, Yes. stuff yes. but what what about matter itself i mean bob had one qubit one mixed state yes. right mm -hmm. and now suddenly out of nowhere he has two 
No, no, he still has one. No? So these two qubits, so he... they are destroyed by the by this measurement, and he he always has one qubit. Oh, so I he, see. He actually so this... takes that qubit, or applies this operation, and that same qubit becomes the in, uh, becomes the state oh, that was. Okay, here. good, good. So then it's not as crazy as I, I was. No, no, no. Uh... There's no like, n there's no like qubit flying from one oh, place. Okay. No, no, it's really you already <laughs> start with two qubits. Uh, in the place, okay. and the only thing you transmit is this classical information. Yeah, and that so it's makes his, the, yeah. It's his original qubit that yes. got transformed yes. when she did the measurement. Exactly. Okay, exactly. so that and that's it's basically we... exploiting this correlation you already have here. It's just some kind of universal kind of correlation that you can use to transform to transport and uh, teleport a, a quantum state over to the other side if you transmit classical information. And this classical information is just some random two bits that come out of this measurement. So, so I guess the, uh, the, the noisy uh, cryptographic analogy is that uh, if uh, both of us have uh, OT correlations, right, uh, and later I can do OT information theoretically, mm -hmm. right? So, so I don't need any cryptographic. So now you're saying, well, if you had quantum correlations yeah. to begin with, I can send quantum yeah. bit uh, with classical, which is classical. Yes. Yeah, I think it's so a good it's analogy. It's more magical than OT correlations, but uh, sort of yes, the analogy. Yes, indeed, right? exactly. But it, it, it's actually people do this this kind of resource theory. You can have a whole quantum theory in in, ter in terms of looking at what kind of resource is required to send a qubit to another person. Well, if you have EPR pairs, then you can actually, a classical bit is enough to send a qubit from that. And, and so there's a whole people make a whole kind of resource theory out of this. And I think something similar you could, you could do with OT. So maybe you have different correlations and then you can argue well, one is stronger than the other and what's the rate of this conversation, uh, conversions, et cetera. But yes, I think it's a very good analogy. All right. So, so this, is, uh, this is like the standard quantum teleportation. And let me show you a, f uh, a fun uh, variation of it that I didn't know until this work. Um, so this is so-called port-based teleportation. So the goal is the same. Alice still wants to uh, teleport an unknown qubit to Bob, but now they come equipped with more EPR pairs. So they not only share one, but they share, share a whole bunch of EPR pairs. And what Alice is gonna do is he's gonna do a little more complicated measurement. So actually a coherent measurement, so coherent means like at the same time over all the qubits. So in practice, something very difficult to, to do, but still um, the, one can mathematically describe what this measurement is. And the outcome of this measurement is now not just two bits, but it's actually an index uh, uh, pointing at one of these slots here. So it's a, it's a random outcome, again, fully random, uh, a number between one and M, where M is the number of EPR pairs that they share. And now, magically, if you do the right measurement here, and, and Alice tells this I to Bob, what's gonna happen is that at the ith spot, this state is gonna appear. And it's gonna appear in the clear, no correction necessary. So, well, that's kind of, that's what I say. In fact, the correction is throw away all the other slots. So just keep the I slot, but the, all the others you can throw away. And kind of by tracing out all the others, you make that state, uh, you get that qubit, and that's ex actually in the state that the Alice wanted to teleport. So this is really, this is really cool that you can actually do that. Um, however, it comes at the price. So it only works approximately. So there's no perfect version here. I remember before it was perfect, um, but uh, and and it and the costs are kind of steep. So if you want to teleport n qubits here, if if it's a big state, then you actually require exponentially many EPR pairs for this to work. So there's some there's some trade-off in how well it works. Um, I mean, kind of we can measure how close the state is that Bob gets in terms of the original state Alice wanted to send. People usually use these fidelity measures. And the better you want to be, I mean, it gets better and better the more EPR pairs you use here. And similarly, if you want to teleport bigger states without corrections, then you also just need exponentially many more qubits. But nevertheless, the fact that you can do that is, is, is kind of cool. And so, we're going to use this later on. So, so for n equals one, right, should I think about these four qubits as uh, four EPR pairs is corresponding to four choices of the quantum one-time pad. And, uh, and the reason sort of Bob doesn't know it is because, well, he doesn't know what the one-time, you know, and this seems a little bit more efficient than that. that if you extrapolated, that would be two to the two N uh, EPR pairs. Maybe this is a bit more efficient. Is that Right. 
I, I think in a sense there's no one time pads here. Right. I think so, so, I mean I have trouble kind of enumerating. So I think you're enumerating overall one time pads, right? Uh, right. I mean in, in terms of like I think what you're referring to is more like a measure of how much correlation you're actually right. using here. Right. And and indeed that that grows exponentially with every qubit you add in terms of like the, the dimension you know, that if you have mm -hmm. uh, two EPR pairs well you have much more dimensional entanglement you share and so that's why it's get, it's get better it gets better and better but i think it's not immediately obvious why you require okay. like exponentially many to have good fidelity mm. but for just teleporting one qubit i think some maybe some constant number is enough but then you will also only get constant fidelity so there's also a relation about like how well it works with in the number of of epr pairs you use um, and how do we define fidelity? Oh, fidelity, it, it, you can think of it as, uh, as inner product. So if for pure states, it would be the inner product. Um, so you just take, um, if you have a pure state, another pure state, just take the inner product. If the, if the inner product is one, then there's the same states. If it's zero, then there are orthogonals, and then they're very different. And, and one can generalize this to, to density matrices in general. But for pure states, it's, it's maybe the inner product, inner product squared, something like that. Okay. Thank you. All these in, in quantum, there are several kind of distance measures. So there's this trace distance, which is important for, and that that corresponds to more the variational distance. So in security definitions, that's the kind of measure you want to use. And fidelity is often easier to work with, but they're all related to each other. So if you can bound one, you can often bound the other, but you might lose some. Ah, yeah, you know this. That's that's the same in the lattice world. No? L2 norm, L1 norm. So it's it's kind of that business. So if you want to convert from one to the other, then you will lose some dimensional factors and um, try and try not to do too many conversions, and then then it's better. I mean, it's tighter. But so in spirit, they're they're kind of uh, equivalent. All so right. On yep. These two points, which are written, uh, that no correction operation is required, mm -hmm. and the second point says that it works only approximately. Can you explain why these two points are not contradictory? Um, yeah, so in the sense, no correction operation required, it, it, it's not quite correct because I mean, it, it, the correction is like throw away all the other slots. So, but the point is that in that slot, you basically already have this thing in the clear and as good as it gets. So there's no way to kind of make it better than it is. It's just that you don't know where to look to start with. Somehow somebody okay. has to tell you which slot was the outcome of this measurement. So when you say correction here, as compared yeah. to the previous slide, you're yes. referring to that one time pad. Exactly, operation. exactly. Yeah. That, 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 that's, that's what I mean. The difference, I don't know if I should go back. The difference here, here is that you here have to, as Bob, you have to explicitly undo this lock here, depending on the information you got. Whereas now the correction is something easier in a sense, you just have to know where to look. But on that spot itself, you don't have to apply a, a, an actual uh, operation to recover the, the state. However, as I said, it does not work perfectly. So the information is there in that slot, but it's not exactly what it was then. But and you can make happens, it as, as good as you want by using more API pairs. Yes. What happens to the other qubits? Uh, they are in some other state, uh, but you don't care. So somehow, mm -hmm. That's not useful. That's not useful information. You have that. However, there are tricks. So you can you can actually reuse them. So they are close to what they were before. So you can actually reuse if you want to do this several times. You can reuse them in later processes. So you can kind of recycle that uh, that that material from there. I see. Okay. All right. So let me uh, come to the to the fun part of the story. So now we have the tools in place. Position-based crypto, remember the, the question we wanna answer is how can you verify that you are at a certain location? Just to come up with some possible uh, examples of this. So you could try to wanna make sure that say a launching missile command really comes from your military headquarters and hasn't been sent by some other people outside. No? So if you could verify that a message originated from a certain place, so that would kind of increase your confidence that it comes from the right person. Or you could think of the other way around. Maybe you wanna to talk to a particular say embassy in another country and uh, you wanna make sure that the message you send, it can only be read within a certain uh, neighborhood of, of, of a particular point. Um, or then there it is kind of um, resource um, 
uh, wasting problems, no, the pizza delivery problem that you, you should only be o able to order a pizza within the neighborhood of the pizzeria and not from another uh, different city or um, and there, like swatting is a problem, no, people just call for fun to um, swat teams. I mean, the gamers have been doing that and somehow like that's quite an expensive uh, joke to, to do. So if you had a way to verify where this calls or where the, where the message come from, then maybe you could prevent these things. Um, uh, just a question about applications yep. of position-based yes. crypto. Yes. Um, is this ever used in, in applications where you have, let's say, multiple provers and you like, you know, you, there are some models where you want your provers to be spatially separated. Right. Um, do people ever use position-based crypto for these like provers to actually prove that they are spatially separated? So like, because right, like they're, protocols were like soundness only holds if I can guarantee this. Yes. Uh, I'm not aware of that. I'm, I, I will specify the model in a little bit more details uh, next and then maybe you'll come back to this question because it depends a lot. There's a lot of possibilities for the models and I'm considering just one particular one and maybe one would actually will need another one for what you're suggesting. But let me remind me of the question uh, later on. Okay. So another question, yes. uh, I mean, it seems like a pretty natural problem. Uh, mm -hmm. What's known classically about this problem? Yes, I will, I will say that, I'll come to okay. that. Um, all right, so uh, basically what I'm asking here is can, can this geographical location of a player be used as, a, as basically the sole cryptographic credential, no? instead of a password, instead of some biometry uh, uh, fingerprints or so. Can just the fact that you are at a particular place be, be uh, a cryptographic credential? So that would be cool if we can do this. And uh, here is a very simplified setting. So for now, we will assume all players live in one dimension, just on this line. And we have two verifiers. We have a prover in the middle and the prover wants to convince the verifiers that she is there, this blue line. Um, and now you also want to make sure kind of the adversary model is that no coalition of fake provers and fake provers are those that are not as the blue line. For instance, we have evil Alice and evil Bob here. Even if they collaborate, they should not be able to convince the verifiers that they are, uh, one of them is at this blue line. So, so somehow that would be the, 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 the goal of this basic uh, position verification protocol. And we're going to make some unrealistic assumptions, namely that communication is the speed of light. This sounds true, but it's actually not true in practice. Uh, like for instance, uh, uh, optical fiber communication is, is only two thirds of the speed of light that you can achieve through, through free space. I didn't know, but yeah, apparently light is pretty slow. <laughs> it's only two thirds of the speed of light uh, through, through optical fibers. Um, uh, we also gonna assume computation does not take any time. So of course that's also not realistic, but uh, compared to uh, the distances we want to consider, it doesn't matter. And we also make sure the verifiers can coordinate. So they know the protocol, they come prepared and see, see what does can it do. Does yes. it matter that you have two verifiers? I mean, can you do it with one or you need Yeah, two? so one can actually show that at least in this, this model I'm considering, and it's a pretty strong one because this, this, this one is fake provers, they can do whatever they want and they can collaborate. You can only verify positions that are in the convex hull of the verifiers. So somehow if, the, if, if you're not inside that, then it could just be arbitrary far away and, and there's no way to kind of bound that. So, so it's, it's natural to consider a prover which is in between the verifiers and on the line, it's just, it's just that. Mm -hmm. um, so let's try to, to build this under these assumptions. Let's have time go, go down here. And the very natural thing to do is to do some kind of distance bounding. So let's have the verifier, um, the first verifier sends some random message X to the prover and the prover is simply asked to return this message back to the verifier who will measure the time it takes for this say random nonce to come back. And uh, this time will, I mean, knowing how fast the information travels, we say at the speed of light, um, you can already put an upper bound on where, how far the prover is away, you know? Because if the prover is further away, then it would take this message longer to get here and then to get back. And so if this was a random message, then, uh, then we can actually already put an upper bound on how far the prover is away by, by measuring this time. And the hope is if you do it from the other side as well, you send another message from the other side that the prover needs to return and you do this measurement, then you basically make sure that the prover is there. Now, this doesn't work because, um, Using that protocol, what an evil Alice and Bob can do is just set up somewhere in between. They intercept this message that comes by here and, and wait for the appropriate amount of time until they return the message themselves. 
No? So if you know what the protocol is, then you can, so notice that here, this, this, these cheaters, these fake provers, they can make it look like to the verifiers exactly as if somebody was here, this blue line. So they kind of fully break the protocol. It, it just simply doesn't verify that somebody is here, this simple approach. So let's do something more uh, uh, advanced. Let's, let's have uh, two messages sent from the verifiers and have the prover compute some function. And think of equality function or maybe something more complicated. Um, and then send back the answers uh, A and B to the, to the verifiers. Of course, they would measure the time again and they would also make sure that these are the right answers depending on the inputs. Um, and let's see if we can break that. So it's not that hard to, to see that, yeah, this also doesn't work because what, what, can, what Alice can do is she can intercept this X um, it's a classical string, so she just makes a copy of it and she keeps one for herself and sends the other one over to, to Bob. And Bobby does the same, he intercepts Y, makes a copy. And now at this point here and here, both Alice and Bob have X and Y, and they can simply do the computation that the uh, honest um, prover is supposed to do and compute the right answers and send that back in time. And and so again, it looks like to the verifiers as, as if somebody is, is here in the middle. And in fact, this seems to be a generic problem. So in fact, one can generalize this and, and prove, and that's what these people do, did in, at Crypto 09, that classical protocols for position verifications are basically impossible because of that. Even in higher dimensions, you can always set up in between, forward everything you intercept and do whatever the honest prover was to do. Uh, just a question about yes. the impossibility. Um, yeah. So like the, this this like totally relies on the verifier's positions being fixed and known in advance, right? If verifiers yes. wanted to like pick any of their positions like somewhat randomly or like move around randomly, then some possibility doesn't apply. Yes, exactly. So so now here there's a, there's a lot of uh, variation what I said before in how you define a model. Also, maybe it's not realistic to be able to set up anywhere you want as attacker, but you kind of uh, maybe only are one you're only one attacker or or less than verifiers and you somehow want to figure out where the verifiers are first or um or as you said maybe um if the verifiers can move then it becomes so so it really so this is this is kind of a a very strong model i consider so it's very hard to find a protocol that actually works in this in this model yeah so yes ma many variations are possible um, all right, but here we're doing, uh, so uh, just before I get there, so what do the attackers need to do? They need to kind of jointly compute the function on the inputs X and Y, but they don't know the other person's input yet. And they're allowed to send one simultaneous round of messages. And we saw in this before, um, these messages in this case are simply a copy of the, of the input they receive and they keep one for themselves. But as I said, this involves copying and we're doing quantum here. So the obvious thing is like, what, what's about sending quantum information? Because then you cannot simply copy this state here. So let's, let's try that, that's what people tried. And with the hope of kind of exploiti exploiting the no cloning theorem. So here's a simple protocol. Um, let's have a qubit, say one of these BB84 states um, or an arbitrary one qubit state sent from the, from one side and a classical bit sent from the other side. And we instruct uh, the honest prover at the, the right location. Um, and we make sure these messages arrive exactly at the same time. So even if the, the position is not exactly in the middle, you can time it that way. And if the bit is zero, then the, the qubit should be returned to the first verifier. If the bit is one, then the qubit should go fly through to the other side. Yeah. So that's the, and then the verifiers would measure, they do it several times, they, um, they kind of uh, make sure it's the qubit that was originally sent, etc. So, so that's uh, the standard thing. Um, and now we're wondering, can you, can you attack this? So let's study the, the attack game and let, let's see what the players have to do. Well, on Bob's side, it's easy, he just gets a classical bit, so he can do the same as before, he just, um, keeps a copy for himself and sends the copy over to Alice. But Alice on her side, she is in trouble because she has a qubit, um, but she doesn't know yet whether she should keep it, if B is zero, or whether she should uh, let it go over to Bob. And, and she, can, she somehow has to 
make a copy here is because she has to decide now. No, so if if she well, she can guess, of course, but then they they will they will not always be right. Whereas an honest proofer will always be right. So you might be able to see a difference. And this was really the hope. People have uh, actually suggested this and even submitted. There were accepted papers uh, with this proposal. Um, however, it turns out that actually one can cheat um, this protocol as well in case that the attackers come prepared. In case they have EPR pairs, you can actually also break this protocol. And I, I want to show you uh, how. So um, that's how it works. Let's say assu assume they have two EPR pairs and Alice has this qubit and what she's going to do is she's simply going to teleport it over to Bob. So she does immediately when she gets it at this bell measurement. And remember, so that gives some classical outcome sigma to her and it will teleport over this qubit to Bob immediately. However, it ends up kind of encrypted with a, a blue key over at Bob's side. So now Bob gets this bit and if this bit is one, then there, oh, well, Alice will also send uh, classically this, this sigma over to Bob. And they're basically done if B is one. If B is one, it, remember it means that Bob should have the qubit, but that's fine because he already has it and he, re he learns sigma in time, so just undoes the quantum one time path and he has the qubit and he can return it. So that's good. But what if B is zero? Well, then Alice should have the qubit. So if he knows that B is zero, he sees, oh, B is zero, well, then Alice should actually have the qubit. So what he's going to do is simply going to teleport it back to Alice immediately. So, so he's going to do um, a bell measurement on his two EPR pairs. So the, the effect of that is that, well, he gets his random outcome sigma prime and this qubit gets teleported back to Alice. Now it's not only encrypted with a blue lock, but there's also a green lock on top because it has been teleported twice in the process. And um, they simply exchange all the classical information, the sigma, sigma prime and B. And now they, they're actually good because that the correct person can reconstruct the qubit in time. Now, if, if the bit is really zero, then Alice, once she knows sigma prime, she can undo sigma prime. She knows sigma herself, so she can undo sigma and she also holds the qubit. And- Question. Question. Yes. So in the previous slide, you told us that uh, previously people thought that this approach would work, but then, you know, there's this entanglement attack, which, they, yep. which was not foreseen. Yep. So uh, the question is that this entanglement attack, it assumes that uh, the cheating provers are sharing this, uh, you know, these entangled yep. uh, uh, qubits. Yes. So this, this is, uh, isn't this like a different model? It's a bit like the CRS model, right? Where... Uh, I mean, or some kind of shared randomness model where you can cheat, but only if uh, you have, you've met before and exchanged uh, somehow these entangled uh, qubits, right? Yes, but in a sense, this is really not a restriction you want to put. No, in principle, why, why shouldn't these attacker have met and exchange DPR pairs before. Of course, in practice, that's very hard to do. So you can say, okay, under re realistic assumptions, they don't actually share EPR pairs because it's just hard to keep them in your pocket. But in principle, like this is more a theoretical study, you want to assume that these uh, attackers have EPR pairs. It's not, okay. it's not uh, because it's also independent of the inputs. No? They can really do that beforehand way before yeah, in principle. Sure. So, so, so yeah, yeah, you're saying that it's not prohibited by the model either. So one has to assume yeah, that- Yeah, and I, I would even argue that it shouldn't be pro prohibited by the model. No, it's, right. it's very natural to assume they actually have that. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Okay, thanks. Yes. And um, yeah, so, so this has kind of, this is a bit weird. Uh, this, so if, especially if you haven't seen it before, the fact that actually, of course, Bob doesn't know whether Alice actually did this teleportation here and whether this qubit is actually here. So from his point of view, this always looks just like some half EPR pairs. So in fact, what you do here, if Bob does this measurement, then uh, it's some, something we call entanglement swapping. In fact, when he does this bell measurement, he swaps the entanglement from being like this horizontally to being the entanglement being vertically. So in fact, if he does this bell measurement, he entangles these two qubits, and this has the effect that also these two qubits are entangled. So if you imagine that Bob acts first, so in actually in the case B equals zero, he does that, he, he measures these two qubits, and this makes these two qubits entangled, and once you know the outcome here, and that in fact makes that once Alice does her teleportation measurement, she just teleports the qubit to herself. 
And that's exactly what we want. So it's kind of, uh, there's no timing here and there cannot be timing because they are very constrained in timing. So this it, it is really some kind of funny quantum thing uh, going on. Okay, so that's, that's how, to, how to break this particular scheme. And so it turns out, well, people then have tried to come up with more complicated schemes, but so the, the main result in this, in this area was that we could actually sh show a general no-go theorem. So you can break all of these schemes if you just have enough uh, EPR pairs. And um, somehow if time allows, yeah, let's see, should, should I just, so I, this, I'm this feeling no that I'm, yeah. Sorry, uh, the snowball theorem, it, uh, it's like a lower bound. So it doesn't just apply to the schemes that were proposed, but it shows that all possible schemes cannot work. Exactly, that's, that's what I wanted to show now. Maybe I should, because it's kind of fun to, to see. It's also the, like the most quantum of this talk. So in the most general, say single round scheme, you have some arbitrary quantum states coming from both sides. The honest prover should run a unitary uh, operation and it should then return the resulting quantum states back to the, to the players. In this case, it's just some Hadamard, but in general, of course, it's some coherent unitary you should perform. And now if you want to attack this, um, then you basically hold these input states. You hold a lot of EPR pairs and you want to basically perform this coherent operation with just one round of communication. So, he, um, so you want to perform this U and um, you can do this by some tricky like back and forth teleportation. I'm going to show you how to do it in a second. So basically it means you do some measurement together with your input state here and here. You exchange one round of messages, could be quantum or classical, but it's just they're independent of each other. They have to be. And in the end, you, you do some correction depending on what you received and you end up with the right output states. So that's the kind of, that it's kind of, I find it still very surprising that you can actually do this. And in our original um, attack, we were using a double exponential amount of EPR pairs. So if in, in the size of the inputs, so this was huge, um, but, you, but still you could succeed uh, with probability arbitrarily close to one. And this, this double exponential has been improved to a single exponential in, in Badgie and Koenig. And I want to show you their, their proof. It's, it's, you can explain it in one slide. So it's kind of nice. So let, let, let me show you how to do it. And they use port-based teleportation. So what they do, uh, Alice um, and Bob, they have the inputs. What they first do is they use a regular teleportation step. So Alice just um, uses her EPR pair to teleport her input over to Bob. So in this slide, I just assume for simplicity that their inputs are just a single qubit, but it could be larger. So she does this bell measurement. This appears on Bob's side, but uh, it's encrypted by, by that. So now what Bob is gonna do, he's gonna use many more EPR pairs, exponentially many in this size, to port tele port base teleport his, his input here back to Alice. So he does this complicated measurement um, with the outcome I. And the effect of that is that this state is gonna appear in the I slot over at Alice's side. Alice of course doesn't know what this, what this slot is, but she knows that well, that qubit is actually encrypted under my original uh, teleportation outcome. So she simply assumes that all these first half qubits are encrypted under that. She undoes this and she removes these locks from all of these. And that in particular does it on the right spot as well, but she doesn't know which the right spot is. And then she just simply applies the unitary that the honest prover is uh, supposed to apply. So she does it, but she does it on all the slots and all these exponentially many slots, she does the operation. And in slot I, she actually does the right stuff. So here it's being transformed into the right thing. Again, she doesn't know yet where it is, but um, well, she's being told in the next step. So once uh, Bob sends this classical information I over to Alice, well, then they both know where to look. Alice, she sends these qubits um, over to Bob. So th th those are the outputs that correspond to his side. So now you can either use quantum communication or you can also teleport them that would just then only send the classical outcome. That's the, that's the same thing. And now they're done because um, uh, they have achieved the, the right computation. So they can simply output, uh, Alice will output the, the output in the I slot. Bob, he also knows where to look, namely at the I slot and there he has his, uh, his output. So, that, so that's kind of the, the trick, how you can break an arbitrary, uh, how, how you can compute a coherent unitary with 
just the NFVP of pairs. So a uh, quick question about this. Uh, how, how does Alice transmit I to Bob? I, I um, how does he transmit what to Bob? I, oh, the location I. I. Uh, so Bob transmits it to Alice. Uh, uh, Bob does the measurement and then he just sends it classically. Oh, okay. So see, they are allowed one round of classical communication, but it cannot depend on each other. Also notice that you can do all these things kind of immediately once you, you get here. Alice will do this immediately, measure the sigma, and on this side, she will undo the sigma on all the first halves of the CPR, do the U, and then immediately send the second half over to her. And then once you know where to look, you actually have the right outcome. Thank you. Okay. So that's the, that's the trick. And um, that shows how with a single exponential number of EPR pairs, you can break any at least single round position verification protocol. But then of course, uh, once you solve the problem, then there's immediately many more questions. Namely, is this optimal? Is this really the best thing? I mean, can we find a protocol that requires a lot of EPR pairs to attack, ideal an exponential amount, but um, which where the honest provers and verifiers are actually doing efficient operations. And there were suggestions for this protocol. So here's a, a simple kind of natural suggestion, like send one qubit from one side together with some classical input X, like an n-bit string and some classical input Y n-bit string on the, from the other side and take some function, uh, some Boolean function, which is efficiently computable, like equality function or in a product, something like that. Depending on the outcome, if the bit is zero, if the the, the compute the function evaluated on x and y is zero, send the qubit to the first player, uh, to the first verifier, and if it, uh, the evaluation is one, then let it go to the other side. So very similar to before, the, the thing before was kind of a special case of this. Now we just instantiate it with some arbitrary function. And now if you wanna attack this, then we know you can attack if you have enough EPR pairs, but of course um, we're gonna, so, so uh, in spirit, you, you want to do the same thing. You want to send one round of simultaneous messages. You want to keep some quantum information and correct, and then end up with the qubit on the right side. And the question is like, how many EPR pairs are, gonna, are you going to need to do this? Uh, so the, the hope is to kind of get a, a bound on the minimum number of EPR pairs required for attacking this particular protocol. So this single qubit protocol with a particular function f we wonder like how many PR pairs do you need to actually uh, break uh, the security as before, like how to compute, to make sure the qubit ends up on the right side. Yeah, so, so this is just the quantity you can define. We know if you have an exponentially many, then, then, you, then you're good. But uh, the hope is, well, for some, the hope is, well, let's take an easy function and then be, show a lower bound on the number of uh, EPR pairs that you need. So that, that was our hope. And for this purpose, we actually invented this, the garden hose model. So um, maybe we can make a, big, a quick poll of people. Have people already seen the garden hose model before? So I don't know if in the participants, you can say yes or no. I don't know, does this work? Can you say, can you use the green or the red? Have you activated this? I think basically anyone that has seen could say yes. Uh, okay. That might just work. So far, not so many, not so many yeses, or people are asleep. Um, like Rishabh has seen it. But. Yeah, Rishabh seen it, but okay, many knows. Great, great. The more knows, the better. Ah, awesome. Okay, because that. So so now it's basically um, a, a new part of my talk, and it will be connected back to the rest. But this is really this is basically only classical stuff I'm gonna gonna talk about here. So uh, the garden hose model is um, is the following. So it's it's a model of communication complexity, as you will see in a second. We have uh, Alice and Bob. Um, they are uh, enthusiast, uh, enthusiastic gardeners and they, their gardens actually, so they are neighbors. So they, sh they almost share a garden, but it's uh, separated by a, a line of trees. So they cannot see into each other, into each other's garden. And also they uh, have a bit of a weird setup because their gardens are actually connected by a number of water pipes, like say S water pipes with uh, the ends on, on one side, on the other side of the garden. Of course, they also have, Alice has a water source and they have a, 
pieces of garden hose. And they also receive some input strings, X and Y. And they want to compute a Boolean function in the garden hose model. So what, how do they do this? So what they're allowed to do is they're allowed to look at their inputs. So based on their inputs, they can connect pipes with pieces of hose. So for instance, uh, Bob, he can look at his input Y and depending on that Y, uh, he can connect say this, the second and the, and the fifth uh, pipe like the ends of the pipes that end up in his garden with a piece of hose. You cannot do any more complicated stuff than that. You cannot have T pieces or you cannot have like, you can only uh, do end-to-end -end connections. And for instance, you would also connect uh, here the fourth and the sixth pipe. And um, Alice also does some, some connections on her side. And she also can connect this water tap um, to one of the pipes if she wants to. She can also just leave it open. And once they're done with this wiring, uh, imagine that the water is turned on. And now it's not that hard to see that actually once you do that, the water will come out somewhere because somehow you cannot have deadlocks. No? If, if Alice doesn't connect it, it will just come out on her side. If it's, if it's connected, then somehow a, if you have a, a loop like here, then the water will also not get in there ever. So of course the water will flow out on, on either one of the sides. And we actually say that if the water exits on Alice's side, the function on these inputs evaluates to zero. And if the water exits on Bob's side, then the function on these inputs evaluates to one. So in this example, I think, yeah, so here if you would turn on the water, then it would flow through the second pipe, then it goes through this piece of hose, then it'll come back on the fifth pipe, it come out on Alice's side. So in this case, the function uh, on these inputs X and Y, this corresponding to this wiring would evaluate to zero. So this is kind of a, a bit of a mouthful uh, to take, especially if you haven't seen this before. But of course, um, what we're gonna do now as computer scientists is we're gonna define the garden hose complexity of a given function f. So imagine f is fixed, think of equality function uh, in a product, something like that. And you wonder, and both players know that, and you wonder you wanna compute this function in this model. And what that means is you have to come up with a strategy that given only your input, you kind of wire up the pipes. And then once the water is turned on, the water comes out on the right side. Uh, on the correct side um, uh, that really computes these functions on this, on this input. And we're wondering like, what is the minimum number of pipes required to compute a particular function f? So this is what we call the garden hose complexity of a particular function f. So to illustrate this, let me give you an example. Quick question. Yes. Uh, is, is, so, so this is no more than the one-way communication complexity, right? Uh, or the other way around, actually, it's less than the. I mean, in the sense, if I have a garden host protocol, I can just send the, you know, which pipes I connected. Alice can send it to Bob, and that's that. That that gives a one. You can, account. yeah, uh, not not quite because you cannot send classical information. You you can agree beforehand, yes, but somehow you have to you have to translate it into a, an actual strategy of wiring up. But I think you're. I mean, you're right that Alice can just wire up. I mean, you can, you can kind of label the pipes by messages Alice would send and then wire, Alice would wire up accordingly. So I guess the other way, so I guess the other way around. If there is a garden host protocol, then there is a one-way communication protocol, right? Uh, because because uh, Alice can just send the, her wirings, like, you know, where she puts um, the pipe and then which, uh, you know, yes, likely think... proportional to the number of uh, pipes, so... Uh, that could work. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is just a model of communication complexity. So there are there are uh, known relations between. Oh. I mean, we'll, we'll get to there. But maybe so, first. Sorry, first I missed something here. Uh, yes, is everything yes. everything here is uh, totally classical right now? Yeah, right? yeah, nothing quantum here. Um, okay. Very quantum under the hood, but I will only show you tell you later. Um, for now, everything classical. No, nothing quantum. Um, so here's a quick illustration. I imagine we want to compute the ine inequality function or equality, but just let's say the water should come out on Alice's side if the inputs are equal, it should come out on Bob's side if the inputs are different. And let's say they have two, two bits, two, two bit inputs. So X1, X2 and Y1, Y2. So here's a way to do this for the players. So Alice could uh, connect the, the water to the first pipe if her first input bit is zero and to the second pipe if her first input bit is one. Now, Bob knows if the water is coming on the first pipe, well, Alice's first input bit is zero, 
And if my input bit is also zero, then I better return the water to Alice. So he connects it to the third pipe. The third pipe is kind of the return pipe. Um, and, um, and so he does that if his first input bit is zero and he connects the second pipe back to the return pipe if his first input bit is one. And notice that if it's different, so, so it's somehow if first input bit is zero here and it's one here, well then actually the water will flow out on this side and that's what we want, that when X is different. So, so basically this first little gadget here, the first three pipes, they actually check equality of the first bit. Uh, and, th and they do it correctly when I mean, you have to verify all the cases, but somehow, and this is the return pipe. And now we could just repeat. We can do the same thing. Like now here is the source and we connect it either to this first pipe or the second pipe of this second gadget. And we check the equality of the, of the second bit. And of course we could go on like that. So this actually gives you a protocol to compute inequality with three N pipes. So this is six pipes for, for two bits, um, but in, in general, um, actually, this, this demonstration gives you an upper bound of 3n for the equality. And, and so this is just a fun little puzzle to think about, and more people have uh, thought about this. So first of all, you can try to show lower bounds, like communication uh, complexity lower bounds. And it turns out that uh, Christoph uh, Pietschak managed to, to show a lower bound um, of n for the inequality function. So for a while, we thought, hmm, this should be 2n. Um, but then it turned out, no, no, it's actually, um, it's, it's less than 2n. And uh, people at IBM, they, they, they asked this as this uh, ponder this puzzle in, in April 2012, and they threw also their SAT solver at finding better and better gadgets. So this has go down and down and down over, <laughs> over the, the course of time. And actually, I think the current world record is, is, is held by the Segedi group of something like 1.35n. And if they do some mathematical co conjecture, assume some mathematical conjecture, then, then they can even get better. But so we actually don't know. So <laughs> so somehow the exact um, uh, garden house complexity for equality is, is not known at the moment, but it's somewhere between n and 1.4n. And um, yeah, so I think this, in the interest of time, I'll skip this. This is just a way to get below 2n. Um, yeah, it's yet another kind of fun strategy uh, coming up. But basically the, go the, the idea is to design better and better gadgets that wor work for larger inputs and have this property that you know where the water ends up and then you can reuse it for doing more and more input. So it, it's kind of a nice little puzzle to, to think about. So this, this one would give you um, 1.54 pipes per bit. So if you chain it, then you get this. Okay, so, so um, let me uh, say something about general bounds instead. So uh, F, uh, the, the cardinal host complexity of F is always upper bounded by two to the N plus one. So here's some kind of trivial strategy. Just take a pair of pipes for all possible inputs of Alice, just kind of label a, a pair of two pipes with, with every possible input. So you need two to the n plus one pipes. And then um, just look at, only use the pair that corresponds to Alice's input. You know, basically connect the water to there. And then Bob, Bob's strategy is clear. Somehow he knows if the water is coming here, well, that was Alice's input. So I can just compute the function. You know? So he, he connects for every pair, he connects uh, it if the, if the resulting output is a zero, well, the water should be returned and come out here and otherwise not. So for every possible uh, input of Alice, he basically computes the function and then either connects or doesn't connect. So that, that's almost kind of the, the trivial strategy you could do. And, and that would uh, lead something like two to the n plus one pipes. So for any Boolean function, you can do this. Question? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, why is why is the garden hose complexity the right thing to look at in this context? Now this is so far I didn't say anything about that. I just defined okay. it and and argued showed you some properties. But okay. I will I will come to that in a second. Okay. Um, okay. So so here I mean the example I think it's clear. So somehow if if he didn't connect it well then the output is one it will come out on his side. If he disconnected then the water will go through and will come out on Alice's side. So so this kind of trivial strategy works. But now of course, so why <laughs> that's exactly answering your question. Like why 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 what is the relationship between and now I'm connecting back to the first part of the talk. That was our hope to connect the number of EPR pairs required for this single qubit protocol with a function f and the garden hose complexity of f. So there is a 
here is the relationship between the two. Well, the garden hose complexity is an upper bound on the number of EPR pairs required. And the number of EPR pairs required is like the minimum of, like we, we wonder about the minimal number and a strategy in the garden hose model gives you a way to do this. And why? Well, here is the kind of translation map. Um, well, think of all the pipes in the garden hose model as the EPR pairs in the attacking game. And think of all the wiring of these pipes as being teleportation measurements, bell measurements. And in particular, connecting the water pipe um, to one of the pipes basically means teleporting this qubit through the maze of EPR pairs. So whenever you have this, um, you would, um, whenever you have this connection, you would teleport this unknown qubit uh, into the second EPR pair. And whenever you have these uh, connections here, you would just do some teleportation or bell measurements here. And the same on, uh, on Bob's side. So whenever there's a connection here, you do this connection here. And it's really wiring up these pipes with garden hoses is really kind of preparing this form of entanglement in, in, in this case. And once you, um, so once you have wired up, you basically uh, exchange the classical inputs X and Y and that, that reveals to the other player what has been wired up, no? because you agreed on the strategy. So once if Bob learns what Alice's input X is, he also, he also knows what, he, what she did on, on, on her side. And you reveal all the teleportation keys. So basically, yeah, every teleportation measurement you do, you get uh, these two bits out, and you basically just reveal all of these um, uh, outcomes to the other side. Because uh, every time this qubit is kind of goes through one of these steps, well, there's this additional lock on top. No, we saw this kind of lock stacking up and to undo these locks, you need to know where the path it actually took. And every, every time it was, uh, it, it went through such a connection, you actually, inc it incurred another lock and you have to know the right order and the right, uh, and the right locks to kind of undo all of this. But you can just exchange that in one round of communication. And so, so using these inputs X and Y, you can follow the water or the qubit through this, through this maze and then correct all the necessary uh, operations that have been applied. And this shows like that if, you're, if you have uh, a strategy in the garden house model, then it will give you a way to do uh, this attacking game. So it gives you an upper bound on the number of EPR pairs required in this, this game. Is this uh, clear? Okay. So, so in fact, when you're thinking about these garden hose strategies, you kind of, uh, you kind of, uh, we tricked you into thinking about uh, strategies to attack the uh, a quantum uh, position-based uh, protocol for this function. And you know, here are a few more results. Maybe that's tying into what we not asked. So, um, unfortunately, these these two things are not equal. I mean, we were, we have hoped we had hopes at the beginning, but somehow it's not so hard to actually find functions where you have high garden hose complexity, but, but you can show that you can do more stuff with entanglement. There's just some more tricks you can play uh, with entanglement. So there's some gap. And then uh, we had some hope that we could maybe fix this gap by just kind of defining a quantum garden hose model. <laughs> so instead of like on top of this classical thing, we also allow the players entanglement. So they could use their input first to a measurement on the entanglement that would give them how they should wire up their pipes. And then, uh, and, and then hopefully uh, kind of, I mean, you also count that amount of entanglement and together maybe that would approximate this um, uh, E notion, but, but it's not clear. So I think we can also come, at least not for um, uh, uh, complete functions, but so for from some promise uh, functions with some promise on the input, we are able to separate these models as well. So it was, a, we, don't, we actually still don't quite know. Nevertheless, we were able to show some results. Um, this one I've already shown you. You can always upper bound the garden house complexity of two uh, with some exponential. Maybe the most important theorem we were able to show is that if f is an easy function, f is in log space, then um, the, the garden house complexity of s must be polynomial. So this is kind of a fun, uh, a, a fun proof and fun statement. Um, but uh, if you turn it around, it's, it's also too bad for position-based crypto because it means that if you want some efficient protocols or efficient F log space, but you want 
to make sure that there's no efficient attack. So they actually need some exponential amount of uh, garden houses. Well, then you have separated P from, from log space. And, and we, yeah, we don't think, well, for a while we thought maybe this is actually a way to do it. <laughs> but I think this is a bit, uh, was a bit optimistic. Um, so uh, yeah, then we, we can show that there exists uh, functions with exponential garden house complexity you simply count. There's not so many ways to wire up things compared to the number of functions. So most functions must have exponential garden house complexity, but we don't know them explicitly. And then you can uh, connect to communication complexity results. So this is, I think, something that uh, Vinod was uh, mentioning. So if you have communication complexity protocols, then you can actually get garden hole strategies uh, with some scaling and people have yeah have improved over this a little bit so 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 the natural thing even though we actually still believe i think that the garden hose we should be able to find some explicit functions that have say non-trivial i mean where you can have super linear lower bounds on the garden hose complexity so somehow it feels a bit you, cannot, you can never have super linear lower bounds general in communication complexity because Alice could simply send her all input and Bob can evaluate the function. But here you cannot send stuff uh, classically. So we had the feeling that we should be able to kind of uh, get some super linear lower bounds, but I think nobody has uh, uh, managed to do so far. So these are kind of uh, just garden house complexity uh, results. And um, I'm, almost, I'm almost done. Yeah, I think good in time. So just a quick summary. Um, I showed you hopefully new port-based quantum teleportation, kind of this funny way of teleporting a qubit. Uh, so I told you something about position-based crypto that you can do stuff um, as long as the attackers don't have too much uh, entanglement. And uh, yeah, also there's this no-go theorem. In general, you cannot if they have a lot of entanglement, but uh, if they don't, then, then you can uh, maybe do stuff. And then in order to study this question, we have kind of introduced this garden hose model. Um, and yeah, so there are a bunch of open problems. So uh, I think most of them I already talked about. Um, and maybe some of them is also old. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm happy to explain this a little bit more if uh, maybe, maybe in a question session. I've also made some overview of, of position-based crypto risk, quantum crypto results on my homepage. So there's some, some timeline of kind of what has happened, but um, maybe not so much in the, in the more recent years. And um, so I can either end here or I can kind of add the slide that I added, uh, the connection to the quantum folio homomorphic encryption uh, world. Um, should I maybe go over this first, or do we first want to take questions? Or it's just really one slide, and it's 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 kind of aimed at at the experts. But maybe I can uh, with, with some explanations. Maybe you have a, a chance to get through it. So here is our idea that we had. A kind of this was the first scheme that allowed to do a polynomial amount of um, quantum operations. Um, in fully homomorphic encryption. So this is this predates uh, Urmila's results, which kind of are better than, than what we have. And you're gonna see why. So, so the difficult step in this quantum fully homomorphic encryption um, problem is to get rid of kind of after, so it, it's doing, so it, it, Clifford operations are easy. So Clifford operations are the ones um, that are easy to apply. So basically, yeah, really, I mean, I could give a whole uh, a whole other talk about this and I don't know how much you have seen, I guess maybe you have seen Ermila's talk, but in general, you um, what you do um, is that you you one time, you take the quantum one time path encryption of, of qubits and that one goes well with Clifford operations because if you apply Clifford operations, then they nicely commute with, uh, with these um, one time path uh, quantum encryptions. And the problem is if you, uh, if you apply a, a non-Clifford operation, and in our case, the T-gate, if you do this, then what you end up with is um, you have some additional phase correction. So this P is, I think, the, the square root of Z, something like that. It's an operation that is uh, applied or not, depending on, on some classical bit of which the, the cloud, the, 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 the one that evaluates, holds an encryption. So you have a classical encryption of this bit B, um, that determines whether this phase correction is there or not. And in order to proceed, you have to get rid of that. So the goal is somehow to remove this PV because then you can just continue the operation, then you're kind of good. So this is the, 
the, the problem that you're usually faced with. And the, here is a suggestion how to solve it using garden hose tricks. So what we do is we basically take a garden hose protocol for the decryption function. So notice that the, the, the user of the scheme has the secret key. So that's the one that encrypts the inputs. He has the secret key. And um, the, the cloud, he has this encryption of that bit. So this bit is the decryption of this value Z under the secret key SK. And so it's like, uh, if you take a, a, a garden hose protocol for it, so the classical inputs are the secret key on the one side and Z on the other side. And what you want to compute is this, is this Boolean function. It is just the decryption of that, of, of, to that bit. And um, you have this qubit here in that state and you want to kind of get rid of this P to the B. So what you can do is kind of teleport it through this maze of EPR pairs here. And um, we know that it ends up on Alice's side if B is zero, and we know that it ends up on Bob's side if B is one. So here is the trick. Take this same garden hose uh, gadget twice, just do the same thing again with the same wiring and connect these two gadgets to each other in the following way. Take all the open pipes on Alice's side and just uh, connect them right down like the first and the second gadget, the same, the corresponding pipes. And take it on, on, on Bob's side, you also connect all the open pipes um, with the gadget on the other side. But here additionally, you do kind of a P to the minus one. You kind of undo the P on that side. Because you know that this qubit ends up on, Alice, on, on, on one of the Alice's outputs, then you shouldn't do anything because then P is, B is zero, so you don't have to remove the P. But if it ends up on Bob's side, well, you have to do a P minus one. And once you put it back into this gadget, you just run it backwards. You know? So if you think of water, if you have this water set up and you put water in here, it will come out on one, either this green or this blue side. And if you just put the water back in into the same wiring, it will, it will run backwards and come out back here, you know, where you put it in. Because all the other pipes are actually closed. So it's, it, it has to come out here. So if you just think of order. And so in fact, what comes out here is exactly the right thing. It's, it, it, is, uh, the, it has that state. I mean, modulo all the teleportation corrections you got on the way and stuff. So you have to handle that somehow. But um, uh, but you have to remove this P. So that, that's, that's kind of the trick. And then our re realization was that this side of this whole thing, you can already prepare beforehand. You just take EPR pairs, you wire them up this way. Be, that means you do teleportation measurements. What, what these are depends on the secret key. So kind of only the user can do it. Um, but but that, that means you prepare this side already and you end up with EPR pairs that are kind of prepared in a certain way. And this is our quantum gadget. So we kind of send that along as quantum evaluation key to the, to the cloud. So if you kind of have that side and you have some user manual how to handle that side, you will just do all this wiring depending on what that is. And in that way, you, you are able to remove this P to the B. So that's kind of the trick. And, and yeah, there's stuff you have to get, take care of, like the get rid of these poly corrections, etc. But that you can do using the classical fully homomorphic uh, property. You just store all these outcomes in some, I mean, you, you give encryptions of these outcomes as, as well, and then you have to handle it the right way. But you see, you end up with a, I mean, it's polynomial size, as long as this function is easy, and that's where you use our theorem, the decryption function in this LWE schemes is, is, is in log space, or it's, it's, a, it's a shallow circuit. And therefore, a polynomial amount of um, pipes of EPR pairs is actually enough. So this this uh, this sketched here is polynomial size. It's still in practice, it's still huge, but uh, it's still. And nowadays, we, we know how to get rid of. So and the, using more advanced um, lattice assumptions, and uh, Urmilas and Zwicka schemes, they can actually do without this um, quantum evaluation key. So this this uh, now has been improved. Or um, there's some, as far as I know, there's no more garden hose tricks now played in, in this setting. Okay, so that's uh, that's it. Um, thanks for your attention. Thanks, Christian. Great, great talk. <laughs> okay. I have one more question. Yes. Uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Sure. Uh, the open problems. Yeah. So, well, I, I didn't follow many of these, but uh, yeah, am well, I, I right? I didn't say much either. <laughs> uh, 
am i am i uh, right to summarize uh, in the following way so with position based crypto we have basically bad news right so classically it's impossible quantumly uh, there's the no go theorem uh, and the hope was that uh, we could at least argue that uh, you know there's a strategy for which the attack would take uh, too many maybe exponential number of etr yes. pairs but we don't even have any candidate function for which we can prove that so any efficient function so that the prover and verifier would be the uh, you know real scheme would be efficient yes. but the attack would be super uh, super yes. poly That's we don't even have that so basically we don't have anything good uh, of course <laughs> Yes, uh, that that's correct. Um, except, of course, if you so, realistically speaking, nobody has EPR pairs just to play with. Of course, that's what what people want. The quantum internet is promising that that you that you have entanglement all over, uh, and just uh, pressing a button and you have entanglement. But uh, that's uh, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> so. Um, in in terms of realistic assumptions, uh, if you even if you can show that uh, you need a constant number of EPR pairs, then you're probably already good. Um, but Actually, from a more a theoretical matter. point of view, yes, it would be nice. So far, I think all the explicit constructions suggested have been broken. With, uh, the the other thing is, uh, I mean. The, the fact that this no-go theorem attack uses uh, a large number of EPR pairs does not really mean that uh, you necessarily need EPR pairs, right? Like for, so for all we know, there could exist an attack that does not actually use any EPR pairs. Uh, no, that's not true. So if we, um, if we assume that the players do not have EPR pairs, then the, the also the original proofs of these schemes are correct. I see. Okay. So then you can Good. actually show proof security of the scheme. Yes. I see. So um, yeah, but that's also a good a, a good check. But if you you have to have EPR pairs to to break uh, to break it. Yes. Do you think uh, that uh, there's any relaxation of this model that might make sense where this impossibility would go away? Um. Yeah. So. I've never really looked into very concrete settings, but of, I think in practice, this uh, it's like moving, uh, players moving around is uh, is probably more realistic so that you cannot mm -hmm. just set up anywhere you want. But then, yeah, you just start making stronger and stronger assumptions of like what is allowed and what is not. But if you, yeah, so, <laughs> You, you you even get into areas of like say wireless security you know people have you, yeah. you, you wonder like how how precise can you actually trace or track a person or like what what exactly their location is <laughs> maybe even these times people uh, like contact tracing is a thing <laughs> no <laughs> so so like can you determine by uh, by technical measures how close people actually are you know so that's um and there, I think there's quite a lot of work uh, in the more practically minded security uh, area where, where people come up with probably realistic models where you can do stuff. So it's not uh, totally out of the question. Yeah, Christian, is there a reason why people don't consider this model of verifiers moving around? Um, I, I guess I think, like, I think... one way of thinking about it is like in interactive proofs, like you, the verifier yeah. like pretty much needs to use randomness in order for it to be useful. And so if here, like, like the verify randomness could be like in its position, right? And, and then, mm -hmm. then you get around these impossibilities right away. Right. Um, so I haven't seen a, like a, say, pro my, like, like a theoretical study of it, but I, I, I do think there's lots of things one, one could consider. I mean, and, and maybe it would be, yeah, I don't know. So I'm not aware of some like, uh, of course, it, the, the thing is it, it, it gets, less clean if you move away from from the model also you you have to it becomes more more difficult to say what is allowed and what is not and then to say clearly ah but then you can or cannot do it often you will get some um also in practice we, we have considered some uh, exper experiments and uh, there you uh, your imperfections turn of course that the position that you verify not into a point on a line but in an interval or even a a, a range and then it starts measuring like how big that range is and like really uh, 
what yeah how good your devices are etc right. etc so, it's, it's, um, it's, but that, it's that would be good enough if, if your application is say to prove that some provers are like spatially separated right um but there, there's like applications yes. where like I, I want like three spatially separated provers and i'm only convinced if they're actually spatially separated right. and so but i think want that to case verify actually... that they are far apart isn't that pretty hard? Because they have to be very far apart, no? So somehow, if you really, uh, if you if you put limits of like uh, speed of light, then to actually uh, um, ensure that they are spatially separated, you they have to be like, I don't know. On Earth, it's even hard, no? So some, some something like that. Uh, I mean, I mean, you would probably want your responses to come like simultaneously, so that they yeah, so that they can't communicate with each other in time. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it would just be like some way to like instantiate some like multi-prover um, interactive proofs. Right. Uh, I know there, there's work in this uh, kind of, people call this relativistic uh, assumptions where they, um, um, also they do, I mean, I think you can do bit commitment, um, but in some multi-agent setting where you set up kind of uh, Bob's players are, you have kind of Bob one and Bob two and they they are close in into this location where the bit is uh, revealed but for some moments as long as and it's always under the assumption as long as they don't come back together again you have you have security um but so it's it must be some some application where uh, that is kind of bit commitment i don't know for for fast trading or so where you just commit a little bit uh, but then later it doesn't matter if it's un, uh, unveiled or it's it's not binding anymore or stuff like that I mean, for these applications, I think you can have stuff um, under under these assumptions. So, uh, I have a question. In one of your slides, you mentioned that there exists a function for which the Cardinal's complexity is exponential. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, in a, earlier slides, you mentioned that SAT solvers found that 1.5 times uh, oh, n bound. Yeah. So the SAT solvers they were for the equality problem. So they were for the very explicit okay. function of equality. Um, yeah. So that that part was just about a particular function, but mm -hmm. it's 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 kind of an easy counting argument that there must exist actually exponentially many functions that have exponential garden holes complexity. So most of the if you take a random function, it will have exponential um, garden holes complexity. But of course, it's it's always the same. You we don't have a we don't know them explicitly. All the functions we can think of, they're they are easy. You no, know, they're in log space, and then then they cannot. So somehow. Yeah, but is it easy to test when you sam once you sample? So you said exponentially many functions have this. Yeah, uh, but then you have a huge. You, you, I mean, how do you sample exponent? I mean, a, a random function. No, you sample the truth table, and then that's exponentially large. Okay. So, so the description of a random function is exponential, and then, so it's not efficient to to, to run it. Um, I also have a question about the final slide. Uh, you. Uh, that uh, th that protocol that the um, evaluator and the, the server and the client set up. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. So with this protocol, it looks like if the server itself uh, is malicious and sets up these uh, pipes on its side in some arbitrary different way, mm -hmm. can it be used to break semantic security? Um, of the of this, for instance, like to be able. Oh no, but he. Let's oh, say yeah. The so, yeah, if he finds out what. Uh, B is that would be bad. Yeah. Um, Did we do that? Uh, no. So we can prove that you cannot do this. But basically, um, um, somehow maybe in spirit, it's if the if the classical information. So if you don't have the classical information, so and that means if you have a proper encryption of the classical information, then it's like not being there. Then uh well what we do is actually on top of of having these uh, entangled things prepared we also put a quantum one time path mm -hmm. because any anyway we have quantum one time paths all over the place because all these teleportations introduce uh, quantum one time paths so all of these qubits are also uh, one time path encrypted and yeah and and, and the inf the information what these keys are is again encrypted in the, in the classical uh, FHG scheme. So, so basically, that hides the structure of of this, of this uh, gadget. Okay. Um, so, so, 
yeah, so under assumption that the classical information is secure, you the quantum interacting with the quantum thing will not give you anything. So even if the server does not connect his pipes and okay, right, this is a non interaction, yeah. I guess. So uh, yeah, right, it's not exactly. So he's just handed this and we can show that what he's handed is, is, is completely mixed as long as the classical information is, is uh, secure. Makes sense. Thank you. So, Chris, I also had a question. Thanks for yep. the talk. Sure. Uh, so about the second question on your open question slide. So about the lower bound thing. Yeah. Uh, is there anything known? Because suppose if you have a lower bound, it could give some sort of win-win results that either a person is at the location or they need to have this much amount of uh, entang fully entangled bits. Mm -hmm. Are there any results of that form? Because a nice, it will be a nice win-win result. Yeah. Um... Uh, so how would that work? So like, you... uh, I, yeah, I couldn't find any. <laughs> That's why I thought that maybe if you might know something, um, I just thought that that could be an interesting trade-off. That right, the party is at a location, or they have like the trapdoor itself could just be basically a lot of uh, quantum information. That's what I was getting at. Right. I don't have any concrete applications of that, but yeah, seen yeah. like the scenario. Yeah. Um, but maybe maybe that would already kind of follow from from the fact that you cannot break it if you don't have entanglement. That means if you can break it, yeah. If you can break it kind of illegally, that means you must have had entanglement. Yeah, and if and if and fine. yeah, if you haven't broken it, if you're just playing the honest game, well then. Yeah. yeah. Then Which one is the amount that you can quantify that? Uh... Yeah. Uh, um, I think. I think that's not so clear. Um, yeah. Okay. Now I understand your question. Like how, how, how mo can you guarantee that you have a certain amount of entanglement if you're able to, to, yeah. to break it? Yeah. Maybe the, the trade-off might be how close you are to the location in a sense. And depending upon that, you can just have a, like a much yeah. more ingrained notion of this thing. Yeah. It would probably also depend on the function itself, right? So for every function you would, I mean, even if for a, any particular function you have, you can come up with, if you can come up with nice lower bounds for any particular function, then maybe that might just be good enough. It's just whether you can have, I couldn't even find any nice lower bounds on any kind of function. Yeah, no, we, we basically don't know. Um, yeah, that's what, I, yeah, I, I couldn't find it, but I thought that maybe he, yeah, there was something known in the language. And there was one other question, so. Uh, there was uh, some, so something, something kind of trivial, I think we can do. Somehow, uh, but yeah, I guess one exponentially bad. That if you're not a look at, I mean, if you can cheat, then at least one you must have one. I mean, one pair. Yeah, and maybe even some 